from ships in this case, the Tomahawk. So that's the military situation as we are able to determine it at this hour. And that is what is going on in that part of the world. Let me go back now to Washington, D.C., where Ed Peck is standing by next to Robin Wright. We introduced him earlier as a man who served in the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, and he's with us tonight as well. Ed Peck, let's go back to the mind of Saddam Hussein. Uh, over the weekend when I was in Baghdad, top Iraqi officials were telling members of the U.N. Secretariat staff that they believe that they can take two waves of attacks from the United States, emerge from their bunkers, and claim victory. Is that viable? option, I suppose, that he has uh, after he considers all the other routes that are open to him. I would tend to think that one of the things that he's going to do first when he comes out of his bunker is call on the Arab world to rise up and support him and to call on Muslims everywhere to do the same thing. You remember back in 1967 in the Arab-Israeli war at that time when uh, the Egyptians accused the United States of taking a role on the Israeli side. They, they sacked and burned American embassies all across the uh, North Africa and through the Middle East. Now when it's the United States that's done it without Israel so far as we know, I'm certain that Saddam Hussein can count on a very strong and very violent reaction from Muslims virtually everywhere. So that'd be one of the things he's going to do when he comes out. And what are the prospects of that succeeding with the Arab masses, uh, to say nothing of some of the other marginal leaders there? Well, I think it's going to succeed very well. Well, fairly well. And I'm not, that's not something that pleases me, of course. But I think that there's going to be a very strong emotional reaction on the part of all Arabs uh, when, they, when they know that the United States has struck uh, co-religionists, co-Arabs, co-ethnists, if you will. It's going to be a strong reaction. It depends. You know, the strength of the reaction will vary from country to country. And it will depend to a great deal on what happens in the succeeding days. But I think that even, even in countries far removed from the actual conflict, and uh, I mentioned Algeria that uh, Robin Wright just mentioned a moment ago, the Algerians uh, are not going to feel very happy about this at all. And the Americans are going to be the ones who will take the brunt of their reaction. Thank you very much, Ed Peck and Robin Wright in uh, Washington, D.C. Gary Sick would like to add something to that. Just one point, and that is I think the place to watch is, first of all, tomorrow morning when uh, things begin to break will be Jordan, first of all, where the situation is already very, very delicate and where the Palestinians can take to the streets and destabilize things. And the other is Egypt, where Saddam is not that popular, but we'll have to watch what happens there and whether Mubarak can handle the threat. Another big part of the equation, of course, is what happens to Israel. We have NBC's Martin Fletcher on the line for us now. Uh, of course, uh, just last week, Tariq Aziz, the Iraqi foreign minister, was saying, yes, absolutely yes, we will attack Israel if we come under attack. Martin Fletcher, uh, I can hear you in the background on the line. Can you hear me now? Yes, I hear you fine, Tom. Uh, what's, the, what's going on in Israel tonight? Well, surprisingly little, Tom. We were expecting that the first move Saddam Hussein make would, would, uh, would make would be a rocket attack, a missile attack on Israel. That hasn't happened yet, as he promised. He, of course, said his first thing to, he would do would be to attack uh, Tel Aviv. That hasn't happened. What that suggests is that the missiles in H2, H3 on the Iraqi border, which is where uh, Iraq would fire those missiles from, it appears those missiles were not ready to be fired, which, is one, which was one Israeli fear. So now Israel has five hours, five hours to count down. That's the maximum time it takes to load uh, one, uh, the, the missiles, the, the Scud Bs. It could take a shorter time, but that's the maximum time. So Israel will now wait five hours. If those missiles don't fall, it would then appear that in that first American attack on I am Liz Mathis. As you know, the U.S. Air Force has launched an attack on Baghdad and on Kuwait. We'll be returning to NBC, but first, let's go to CNN and see what they have in these reports. While you're reporting, I just want to pull your head out of that window. <laughs> Bernie, you're a good friend. Um, the best way to see, though, is to look. And uh, as, I, as I do look, I'll, I'll try to keep my head as, as far down as I can. All my friends have been giving me advice for months. When you go back to Baghdad, keep your head down. I'm trying to do that. There's a, there's a sound outside now. It, it might be a motorcycle or it might be a helicopter. I can't tell. Uh, maybe even a truck. I, a truck. Yeah, a truck. And it's down on the road below maybe the July the 14th bridge that, uh, that goes across in the area where the United States Embassy uh, 
um, was before the embassy was shut down here. As we well, were, you, you know, that fellow, must, the driver of that truck must know something we don't know because I damn sure wouldn't be on the road right now. <laughs> I'm not real happy to be at this hotel, Bernie, but we're here. And uh, let's do this. There's still a few lights on on the streets below. Um, there are obviously some government vehicles down there doing some damage assessment, but the skies and over Baghdad are quiet now. And, uh, you know, Bernie, maybe very soon we should check back with our colleagues and see what else they can tell us about what's going on. Before we cut away from Baghdad, I just want to say, if you were just joining CNN anywhere in the world, we are reporting on the third, was it the third wave, uh, no, Peter Arnett? Probably four or five. We, or fifth. we are reporting on the fourth or fifth wave of bombing runs and the reaction on the ground of Iraqi anti-aircraft guns. And, Bernie, I believe they were the F-15Es from Saudi Arabia that were reported on, as on CNN earlier. They were apparently coming in this direction, but it has been deathly quiet here for about uh, 20 minutes. It seems that this initial raid is over. Let's uh, take John's suggestion and uh, go back to Atlanta now, just in case our colleagues on the network have more information for you. Bernie Shaw, Peter Arnett, and John Holloman at the Al Rashid Hotel in Baghdad, of course, we'll be back to you, and thank you very much for your reports. We're happy to see that you're in, in good spirits. You have a terribly large story to report. We're going now to the White House. President Bush will address the nation at 9 p.m. Our senior White House correspondent, Charles Bierbauer, is there. Thank you. David, I think that as we find the detail unfolding and what is transpiring here tonight, we will see that the timing is very meticulous and that when the president speaks here at the White House at 9 p.m. Eastern time, it will be 5 a.m. in Baghdad. The dawn will be approaching and people will there be getting a sense of just what has been wrought in the course of the night. And there was a purpose behind that to have the president make his address uh, after these first waves of bombing have taken place. We're also given to understand that the president will try to seek a tone of reassurance in this speech, reassurance to this country to be sure, and an explanation that diplomatic efforts had been exhausted before taking this step. Uh, we also understand that the congressional leadership, the main people on Capitol Hill, that would be Senators Dole and Mitchell, Congressman Foley and uh, Michael, have been informed by the president. David. Thank you, Charles. We'll be back to the White House again, the presidential address to the nation at 9 p.m. We go now to Jerusalem and uh, Richard Blystone. David, uh, here in Jerusalem, the Israeli army has just made an announcement over the Israeli radio. It has advised Israelis to stay home and to open the kits, these boxes which contain their gas masks. It has uh, told them to stay there and keep listening to the radio. However, there is no alert here, there, is no, there are no sirens, and there is no indication that the possible Iraqi attack for which the gas masks are intended is even uh, underway or planned. Back to you, David. Thank you very much. Richard Blystone reporting that Israeli citizens are being advised to break out their gas mask kits and have them nearby. We're going back now to Baghdad at the Al Rashid Hotel. Bernard Shaw, Peter Thank Arnett, you, and John David, Holland. this is Bernie. Go ahead, Bernie. I'm just crouching down here on the floor to uh, get a better point of observation. The sky over Baghdad is black. You can hear an occasional truck or car go by. But you wouldn't know that there's life outside these windows. We no longer see tracer bullets. We can tell that uh, there are fires off in the distance. It is eerily quiet right now. There's a very cool breeze blowing through the window here. And uh, we are sweating in more ways than one. Uh, Peter Arnett is here. John Holloman is here. Uh, you know what occurs to me? I didn't get dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we have tuna fish, Bernie. Lots of tuna fish. <laughs> We have, uh, we have put in stores of supplies here. We've got tuna fish and crackers and lots and lots of water. Now, if uh, this is going to be a short war, as uh, experts in the United States suggest, maybe we won't need to eat too much of that. The, uh, yeah, John, here we are to you. I, I just would tell you, Peter, that I hope we do, because I had a very difficult time at a rocky custom to the airport bringing in a huge case with 100 pounds of canned tuna fish in it. I hope we get to use it. Anyway, let me stick my head up near the window again and look out and tell you, as my colleagues have reported to you in the past, it is extraordinarily quiet here now. There are no signs of anti-aircraft fire. One thing that seems singular to me is that, uh, oh, four weeks ago, 
there was a major drill in Baghdad for blackout procedures. And they were able to black out one side of the city one night and then the other side of the city the other night and were able to do it very efficiently. The Iraqi government is so well organized. It's, uh, it's just singular to me that it took them nearly an hour to black out the city. Well, they are well organized, but uh, Peter? No, my feeling is that the, uh, this was a surprise attack. I think the impression was given to us and maybe the rest of the world, we're in a cocoon here, that there'd probably be 48 hours of uh, possible negotiations, renewed attempts uh, to get some peace movement going. And that's why while there was tension in the city today, there wasn't too much concern. There wasn't much concern around this hotel. Many journalists had made leisurely plans to leave in the morning on a scheduled Iraq Airlines uh, flight. Don't forget the CNN charter. And there was a CNN charter coming in for Bernard Shaw. So the fact that the president did order the raids tonight seems to me uh, to be a surprise attack. It could well have caught the Iraqis off guard. We don't know that, though. Well, yeah. we, we have to wait to hear uh, President Bush's address, not only to the United States, but to the world. But, Peter, my instincts tell me that this, what we've experienced the last two hours, this is meant to be a sample. Yeah, I think, I think that's right, Bernie, because if... Uh, if the Iraqis, uh, or rather if the coalition had wanted to destroy Baghdad, they would certainly have uh, been able to do a lot more than they did here. And we don't know, of course, what's going on in Kuwait right now. We won't know until we learn from either somebody there or from government the United States or coalition officials in Saudi Arabia. Peter? Well, now that we're speculating a little, my interpretation of the analysis of the last few weeks is that the president wasn't interested in another, what they call, Vietnam situation where you would have... Uh, bombing and then an assessment, uh, hope for a political move on that hand. I thought it was all going to come at once. In fact, in the very distant horizon, we can see the sky lit up with, with bright, uh, seemingly bright uh, yellow, uh, yellow uh, I hesitate to say explosions, it's light. It seems to me that planes are pounding targets possibly 15 to 20 miles south of here, Bernie. Well, of course we should... Uh label our speculation for what it is um, it's going to be daylight here in about three hours and we'll have a much better idea and of course uh, in less than 90 minutes uh, president bush will be speaking from the white house and uh, we'll have a specific idea of united states intentions yeah. i think all of us uh, peter bernie and i all feel that because we're in baghdad we're we're the middle of the story and i think probably from the, certainly the aspect of the red, yellow, and orange pictures that you're going to be seeing on television tomorrow, if we can get them out. Most of them will come from here. But we should again check in with our colleagues around the network to see what else we can find out about this. Here we go. We'll go back to the, uh, to the rest of CNN. Go ahead, fellas. Thank you very much, John and Bernie and Peter, reporting from the Al Rashid Hotel in Baghdad, where Operation Desert Storm has struck with air power attacks by the multinational forces. And uh, for that uh, update, we'll go now to the Pentagon and Wolf Blitzer. David, Pentagon officials say it should, it, should, it should have come as no surprise that this attack started tonight. They say that the United States wanted to start the attack at night. There are specific targets for almost five and a half months. The United States has outlined virtually every strategic target in Iraq and occupied Kuwait. The U.S. airstrike was almost certainly designed to begin with the stealth fighters, the F-15Es, the F-16s, as well as the Tomahawk unmanned cruise missiles that have been stationed in the Persian Gulf aboard some of the aircraft carriers. There are two there now, as well as the battleships Wisconsin and Missouri. Pentagon officials say that right after the President's address to the nation, 9 o'clock Eastern Time, both Defense Secretary Dick Cheney as well as General Colin Powell, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, will come here into this room and brief the news media on details of the U.S. operation. It obviously has been well planned. Obviously, it's something that the United States has been planning for some time. Now let's go to Baghdad, where our colleague uh, John uh, Holloman is standing by. Well, thanks. Uh, as soon as we uh, were uh, confident that the skies were going to stay dark for a while, they lit up again. And uh, there are more tracer rounds. We can hear explosions off in the distance to the west of uh, central Baghdad. And uh, we don't know how far to the west, but uh, I can put the microphone out the window and maybe we'll get to hear some of the sounds of these explosions just for a moment, or at least the anti-aircraft fire that is uh, it's going with them. It's like a rumble, almost like an earthquake sort of a sound, or a, a giant diesel engine revving up off to the west of our position. The sky is filled with tracers. Bernie Shaw. Go ahead, Bernie. 
Well, hold on. Let's let our viewers hear what's happening. Yeah, okay. We're going to let you listen to the anti-aircraft fire um, and the sound of these bombs falling here in Baghdad. Iraqi anti-aircraft fire is not as great as it was an hour ago, is it, Peter? No, it's not intense in that part of the city. And what interests me, John, is that there doesn't seem to be any surface-to-air missiles going up. Now, whether these were knocked out in early strikes, I don't know. But, uh, but the uh, Iraqis do have several hundred SAMs that are capable of knocking down any aircraft up there. Bernie? And, Peter, the Iraqis could be holding their SAMs uh, in abeyance. Yeah, that's a possibility. We, we had heard from uh, a briefing that we got some months ago that there were two surface-to-air missile sites uh, in the in the area and uh, it's uh, one of those things that uh, the Defense Department officials are probably not wanting us to talk about but uh, the government is, of Iraq is certainly doing what it can here to uh, to fight back. Well not only the Defense Department, I don't know if the Defense Department cares, but the government of Iraq probably is concerned about us talking about information. I, I want to point out that anything we've gleaned basically is from U.S. news media and sure. experts, and we've found nothing, uh, nothing here that uh, we haven't been allowed, in fact, to see much here. Certainly. We are confined to the hotel. We can give this report tonight because we're on the ninth floor of the Al Rashid Hotel, which has a commanding view of this very flat city to the north, south, east, and west. And for about the last two hours in the north, south, east, and west, there has been, there has been, correct me, there's the last hour to the north, south, east, and west, there has been enormous activity. Now we hear planes actually going over here. Yeah, well, I'll see if I can see anything. All right. There's a plane nearby. Bernie, you can see something? Right. It's broken out on either side of us here at the hotel. And I'm just going to be quiet and let you listen. Well, my point is, 
this government wants word put out. This government has a... Well, as you know, we are an NBC affiliate and also a CNN News subscriber. So during the course of the evening, we will be switching back and forth from the two to give you the best coverage. We now go to John Cochran at NBC in the White House. Some things that uh, the White House had said uh, really is not a problem. And uh, we had heard that it was a problem with the Israelis. The Israelis had complained that they weren't being clued in, as it were, on what our war plans were before the attack began. One thing the Israelis were worried about was that if, in fact, uh, the Israelis felt uh, in, in danger of those Iraqi missiles, they'd go in there with their jets and try to take them out. They might run into our planes there, and our planes and their planes might start firing on each other or conceivably, I suppose, even collide into each other. Other. Here at the White House, I'm told that uh, they, they never regarded that as a serious problem. Their feeling was that the Israelis were trying to find reasons to get more information. Quite understandably, Israel na has a deep national security interest here. The White House uh, staffers I've talked to are not being critical of the Israelis. They say that's not a problem. What I don't know is how much information the Israelis have been given. Obviously, they're being given some. This is a very sensitive issue, Tom, because Arab countries are going to want to know whether or not the U.S. did this in cahoots with the Israelis as you well know. Right. John Cochran, you're absolutely correct in that. Uh, we want to give you uh, an update on the situation now as you stand by there. It is called Operation Desert Storm. It has been underway now for almost three hours, we believe. It began with Tomahawk cruise missile attacks on the capital of Iraq, Baghdad, as you can see. Uh, that is an F-15 plane that we have flying over there. They were launched as well with long-range fuel tanks, probably to hit ground positions, possibly in southern Kuwait, but maybe military targets within Iraq itself. The primary objectives in the first wave appear to have been military installations and probably radar sites, because the radar would be crucial to the Iraqis in responding to any kind of an attack. There are now reports, again, coming out of Baghdad of a new wave of attacks underway. Uh, we do not know what that means precisely at this hour. The center of the city apparently still is intact. Uh, Saddam Hussein, where he is at this hour, uh, we cannot say. We presume, of course, that he is in a bunker, possibly somewhere in the Baghdad area, but he could have gone to the mountains. He has retreats there as well. He is battle-hardened, eight years against Iran. He's a man who fought and killed his way to power, beginning in a very small uh, village in uh, Iraq called Tikrit. And from there, he built this enormous political and military power in the most ruthless possible fashion, killing anyone who stood in his way, saying, I know of the people around me when they're disloyal before they know. NBC's John Cochran at the White House. Tom, we're just learning that the president has been working on the speech, which we'll hear later tonight. He's been working on it for two to three weeks. That gives us a lot of uh, insight into his mindset. Obviously, he thought this was uh, a likely possibility. You don't work on a speech for two or three weeks unless you think you're going to deliver it, although obviously hoped at the last minute that Saddam Hussein would withdraw his troops and he wouldn't have to go on the air with the speech of about 10 to 12 minutes uh, duration. The uh, few remarks that Marlon uh, Fitzwater had a uh, short time ago, that would be about uh, almost an hour ago now that was devised uh, in a hurry the president is still watching uh, a lot of television incidentally one of the reasons around here we suspected there would be no attack today is that Marlon Fitzwater came out to this podium behind me earlier today this morning and issued a personal appeal for journalists in Baghdad to leave and later talking uh, with Fitzwater privately he said listen I'm speaking also on behalf of the president he knows a lot of you guys he knows a lot of you guys reporting from Baghdad He's concerned about you. He thinks it's crazy that you're there. Uh, Fitzwater said, I tried to explain to him that's what you guys do for a living. That's the ethics of your profession, to be there where news is happening. And Bush was saying, try to get him out of there. However, the reason we didn't expect the attack today is there really was very little time for people to come out of Baghdad. And given the president's concern, we thought maybe he was going to hold off another day or two. So I would have, would have to say most of us were caught by surprise here, Tom. Thank you, John Cochran. We have some additional information from, uh, for you. From a very high-ranking uh, Arab source tonight, we are told that the Baghdad airport and a large number of missile batteries around it were the first targets. They, uh, we're told that there was no ground resistance, that the attacks were successful. The early attacks were not massive, but they were concentrated and effective. That, as I say, from a high-ranking Arab source in a position to know. 
We'll tell you as well that uh, in Tokyo and other places where the financial markets are open, it is chaos at this hour. The Tokyo market was off about 300 points at one point, and oil prices were up three bucks a barrel. That is not unexpected, of course, in the first wave, the first flush of shooting, when there can be no certain outcome. The financial markets uh, almost always are in some kind of havoc, and that certainly is the situation tonight. Uh, that could very well stabilize. We'll not know what happens in this country. Uh, Colonel Harry Summers is uh, one of the best students of uh, American military policy in this country. He's in our Washington studio right now. Barry, do you have any sense whatsoever of how the Saudi Arabian civilian population has responded to the beginning of war? Can you look out your window and see anything? It's what, almost 4 o'clock in the morning? Well, it's almost 4 o'clock in the morning, and uh, we don't see very much from the windows here, Peter. Uh, there are some people who are planning to venture out and take a look. Uh, I can tell you that uh, today... There has been, uh, you know, a fairly high level of anxiety, but certainly I don't think anything approaching panic. Uh, they are quite stoic about it in many cases, saying, you know, if God wills it, they will be fine, and if God doesn't will it, they won't. Um, I think that basically the Saudis particularly for a long, long time have assumed that this day would never happen, that somehow uh, they would be rescued, the uh, deus ex machina, and uh, everything would be fine. Uh, so it's perhaps a little premature to, to, uh, to predict what their reaction is going to be now that war has actually begun. Okay, thanks very much, Barry. As you point out, the Saudis have been uh, fairly calm throughout this whole thing, saying the Americans will protect us. So as Barry points out, hearing the air raid sirens in Riyadh, which is about, um, looking at my chart, about 616 miles to Baghdad, but less to Kuwait. Uh, about 332 miles to Kuwait. It's a very long range, as Barry Dunsmore points out, and as our one of our military analysts, Tony Cordesman, has pointed out the Soviet or even the Iraqi refined Scud missile, one of their heavy range.